Today, we're going to talk about discipline. Um, and you guys are uh, probably here because you're familiar with the Montessori method. So of course, I'm going to be talking from a Montessori context and perspective. But just know that everything that I'm talking about, it's informed by what we know about works best for the brain and for emotional development. So these are not Montessori specific things. They're sort of just things that are what we talk, what we're going to talk about in terms of discipline and emotions. It's applicable to any family, to any child, and to what we know from scientific research works best in terms of discipline and supporting children learning self-regulation skills and such. So first, uh, one of the things that we talked about uh, when Lucy and I were talking about, well, what do we, how do we narrow down the many things that go into discipline and emotional development? And I thought about covering a little bit more about limits and consequences today, because this is a topic that sometimes gets so tricky to really understand as a caregiver that is really hoping to instill respectful discipline and respectful parenting at home, which is, of course, or positive discipline, which is part of the Montessori philosophy as well, right? Partly because when we think of discipline, we often immediately think of punishment. Right. In fact, that's why some parents or some caregivers or even educators that want to have a more respectful approach, they kind of shy away, shy away from even mentioning discipline because they're like, well, I don't, I don't want to punish. That's not what we do. But then often that lands into takes us into the territory of permissiveness, and that's why a lot of people mistakenly think that to engage in respectful, positive discipline means free for all. There's no limits. There's no boundaries, and that's not the case. So first, let's talk about really what it means. Um, what discipline means. So I'm going to start sharing some slides to kind of get on the same page of what, what discipline means. Like, what are we talking about when we're talking about discipline? So first, I'm going to make sure that you see it. It's kind of like discipline with a little umbrella thing. Everybody sees it. Perfect. So when we talk about discipline, we are not talking just about limits, punishment, and consequences. And by the way, when we talk about consequences, we often think, oh, consequences is punishment. Punishment and punitive strategies are negative consequences, but there's other type of consequences that do lead to learning. So we're gonna make those distinctions today. But discipline is just, it's more than just what we do in moments of challenging behavior. Discipline is a way in which we teach children skills. Discipline means to teach. Actually, let me stop sharing this so that you can actually see my face as I say this. Discipline means to teach. When you're thinking, well, I may need more discipline at home. I want you to reframe it and think, I need to be teaching my child this specific skill a little bit more. And when you think about, oh, we need more discipline in this specific situation, just reframe it into, we need to teach our child a little bit more skills when it comes to this specific scenario. We're always teaching skills. So now that we have that reframe, and hopefully you can take this with you, the discipline means to teach. We need to remember that every time we are addressing a challenging behavior, we are doing so with the intention to teach a skill. I have met zero parents that regardless of what strategy they're using, they want to purposely harm their child. Every parent that has in any at any point intended to use a consequence or, or have a, a teach something, even though it may not be the best way, they're always doing so with the intention to teach for their child to learn something else um, versus the, the challenging behaviors that they, they may be engaging in. In the end, discipline is about teaching how, how to respect their environment. That's usually the goal that we have when we're engaging children in, in discipline. We want them to learn how to respect others, like if they're hitting or if they're, they're engaging in tricky behavior in the park or hitting a sibling, we want them to learn how to respect others. We want them to learn how to be a family member in our home, why we kind of get them to kind of clean the table or clean up the room, please pick up your toys. We're trying to do that, not just because we want to nag them. We want to do that because we want them to learn how to be members of, of our home, members of the world. Yes, you don't jump in the couch because we want to ca take care of the couch, but we do that same thing at the bench at the park and such. So you're helping them learn how to be citizens of the world. And we do so because we want them to also develop self-discipline. That is the goal. We're teaching all of these skills so that they can take the skills with them later on. Because if we focus on punitive strategies that depend fully on our control and on us giving a negative consequence and hope of teaching, then we're missing really the mark and actually teaching them skills that they're going to take later on. 
were teaching skills through lots and lots and lots of repetition. This process takes years, years really. And we're doing so in a positive way, which may not be always like happy, go lucky, rainbows and butterflies. But the purpose of not engaging in punitive strategies is not only because it doesn't work for how we know the brain learns, but also because it can harm the relationship if we constantly have a relationship of teaching that is just top down and that it's it's grounded on power and on struggle. As we teach, we are also building a relationship because this toddler, I think most of you guys, you can tell me kind of ages, but most of you guys, if you have a toddler or a young child at home, as you're teaching them how to navigate respect, as you're teaching them self-regulation, as you're connecting with them to teach them something new at home or how to shift the challenge in behavior into something more respectful for them or the environment or others, this is the same child and the same relationship that you are building and nurturing for the adolescent that you're going to have in 10 years, for the child in college that is going to have those skill is going to need to have those skills internalized later on and that needs hopefully comes to you as a source of teaching and connection when something doesn't feel right so you're nurturing a relationship you're not just telling a toddler not to hit you're nurturing a relationship so let me go back to this visual um, and remind us that we don't just then teach in this tricky situations or when something goes wrong we are teaching all the time we are teaching by the way our environment is set up, like some things are at your reach because they're for you, some things are up on the shelf because they're not for you. That's that's a limit right there when we're not getting into a tricky situation, but that's part of the discipline in our home. What's available for you? What is not available? If you're gonna get dressed, yeah, these are the options. There's two or three options for you, but not everything because that's a limit I'm setting through the environment. We set limits through how we connect, we set up our home. We teach about respectful behavior through conversations that we have. If we're preparing for a sibling, a new sibling coming in, we're doing lots of reading about it, probably. We're reading books about how to be gentle with our friends, how to take turns, different things. We teach, we discipline through conversations and books, through participation, how we teach to use knives or glass or different things safely in the kitchen is by inviting them to participate. Discipline is teaching at all times, even through play. We, there's something tricky about a behavior that they're having with a sibling. We could engage in some pretend play and kind of play out that scenario and see how it goes out in a safer environment with them through play. That is a discipline. We can teach a new skill on how to handle that differently through play what we model i want you to clean your room why won't would you pick up after yourself are we picking up after ourselves like what are we modeling we are teaching and, and teaching discipline through what we model and yes sometimes there is challenging behavior and we will engage in actually setting a little bit more firm boundaries in that moment or natural and logical consequences not negative consequences those are what are would be more pun um would be punishment but as you can see from that visual that's just a portion of our role in discipline discipline is to teach to teach skills to teach to think about the larger goal that you have for this child and that's not just in the moment of scuffles so i don't know if any questions come up from there please remember that you can come put questions in the chat so the next question that i am usually i usually get is great but if we cannot, I get this thing that discipline is to teach and I wanna engage in positive, respectful discipline, but Blanca, if I'm not engaging in a harsh punishment or in a harsh consequence for a child hitting another child, then how are they gonna learn? And if you have asked yourself that, you're right on the money with a lot of different people that have the same question, which is why what I wanna to go to next is helping you understand how the child learns. Because what we know from decades and decades of research is that not only are punitive strategies not always not, not respectful for the child and their developmental stage in many times or the skill building that they are engaged in in that moment, but that they're just simply, they just simply do not lead to learning. When we engage with a child and we isolate them after they behave in a challenging way, or if we're trying to teach a skill through a timeout or yelling, the brain doesn't learn. So it's simply not just not respectful, but it's, it's just not effective. Let me tell you why, by showing you actually a visual of your child's brain. 
when a child is engaged in a behavior that is, let's just say for the purpose of this, just disrespectful, flat out disrespectful and harmful to another child, like hitting, screaming, kicking, like if they're mid tantrum, if they're spitting, if they're biting, if they're throwing, something like that, that's dysregulated behavior. And that behavior comes from this part that we refer to as amygdala, the brainstem, that we refer to in the model of conscious discipline as the brain states model as survival mode behavior. When you see a child engaging in behavior, for example, like making, um, physical dysregulation, the hitting, the biting, unexpected, unexpected intense meltdown, screaming out of the top of their lungs, or even other behavior that may not be as externalized, such as shyness, fearful, complete withdrawal. That's a child that's telling us, my brain doesn't feel safe and is really not ready for engaging in any learning at this moment. And usually when they're hitting, they're screaming, they're biting is when we yell back, if we are dysregulated as well, we're done, time out, you can't do that and we take them away at a time when their brain is actually not even receiving language. This part of the brain, the survival state brain, doesn't really respond to language and is nowhere near ready for learning. So what we, this part of the brain needs in those moments is to feel safe. And what happens when a child is in a state of the brain when they don't feel safe? And a response is to yell, to scream, often from high up. So I'm also top down, like I'm, I'm exerting my power as a, as a person. And it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's really not a safe, a, a signal of safety for the brain. That's why we actually usually get a by level to offer the child safety. Sometimes we don't even use words. We just connect through touch. This part of the brain really responds well to touch, to rocking, to humming, to music, to a singing. That's how this part of the brain connects and feels safety and presence. So when we put a child in a chair and we leave them there or we send, go to your room and send them away, when the ch this part of the brain literally needs safety, we're teaching a lot of things, but we're not teaching the skill of not hitting. We're teaching when you do this, then you get to be really not safe because I'm not going to be with you. And they also start internalizing that they're just really not a good person. That's usually what happens. We're missing out on an opportunity for teaching because we're not really teaching them skills and we're making them feel even less connected in moments when they need us. There's another piece of behavior that tricks us into thinking that the child is actually ready to learn and is gonna engage with us in teaching and, and learning and getting through a problem solving situation. Um, like for example, when they're really irritable, when they're having a, a kind of like a meltdown, but not a full on tantrum, when they're rude, for example, or rude, quote unquote rude, like for example, if they start yelling like, I hate you, mommy, you're the worst mommy, I don't love you, and all of those things that are like, whoa. Or sometimes even like, you know, if it's not a, even, even a bad word that they don't really know the language, the, the meaning, for, but they're just yelling it out. A lot of, a lot of cry, um, clinginess, a lot of whining, all of those situations, that, all of those behaviors that we see don't necessarily come from a, a safety place in the brain, but come from the limbic system and what we refer to as the emotional brain. It's kind of like if you came home and you saw piles and piles of clothing, like the dishes are piling up, laundry's piling up, beds are not made, and you just got home from work, you have to feed the kids, and, and you're feeling, you start feeling that that kind of rage come up, and your partner walks in and has, okay, so what's for dinner today? You're going to feel, you're not going to fully dysregulate, maybe, but you're going to feel so, probably so angry and so upset. You're going to feel probably like, all the work that I do is not, is not valid here. Nobody helps me. And you start, you're going to start getting really emotional. And it's definitely not a good time for you to get into a reasonable conversation with your partner about division of labor and mental load and all of those things. That conversation probably needs to happen, but that's not the moment to have it because you're upset and you're in the middle of something. That would be the equivalent of an emotional moment there for your child where sometimes something, something happened at school or they're still getting used to having a, a sibling at home or something happened where they're whining and they're clingy and we're upset and we wanna set a limit. But they're truly at a place where they're just, they just want to feel loved and they just want to feel belonging in their environment at that moment.
And usually what we want to do when we're teaching skills and we're setting limits and we're setting boundaries and we want the child to engage with us in learning and collaborating with that boundary, please clean up. Okay, can you please put your clothes on? It's time to get out of the bath. Come on, it's time. And then just doing that nicely. The part of the brain that we're hoping to hit is this part, is the executive state, the, the prefrontal cortex that, by the way, doesn't finish developing until your child is in the mid 20s. And that takes so much practice for them to actually learn all of these things, but considering a positive alternative, making choices, taking a turn, making eye contact with you for finding a solution or making a choice or problem solving, telling you what is wrong. So often a, a, somewhat, a kid hits another kid and we're like, why did you do that? Well, we already said that that behavior comes from more of a survival state of the brain. Something made them real upset. They're, then they don't know why they did it. it. It was a survival kind of instinct from their brain. It's not reasoning behavior. That belongs over here. So the truth is they might not even know why they did it. That is over here. And when a child is able to be in this state, this is a state of the brain where we actually consider the involvement, when we offer choices, when we discuss their emotions for them to kind of tell us what they're feeling. But until then, we really kind of, what we do is we kind of have to manage and navigate the storm with them. Yes, placing limits and boundaries, but understanding that Oftentimes, the boundaries that we set, the limits that we set, the choices that we want to give them in that moment, or even the lecture that sometimes we want to give them. Well, you know, I told you no hitting, like you remember, we practiced that. All of those things are usually available only when the brain is ready. And if we really want to teach a skill, if you think about that umbrella and we want them to respect their brothers and we want them to not throw food at the table, all of those teaching moments have to happen when the brain is ready. So not necessarily in the moment of the of the scuffle. Trying to see if there's any questions come up. So the next question would be, okay, I get it. I want to respect the brain. I get that I can't teach. I get that punishment maybe is not the way to go. I get that punitive consequences may not be the way for them to teach the skill. But but then when? When how do I do this? Like how do I get so when you are facing tricky behavior with your child, whether they're hitting where they're throwing toys, where they're breaking things, where they don't want to get out of the bath, they don't want to brush your teeth, they don't want to get dressed. Like we have a million examples, right? I want you to think about three, I want you to ask yourself three main questions. Let's say a child hits another child. I want you to ask yourself before you even go into taking action or wanting to set a consequence or place a limit, why? Are they acting this way? What is behind their behavior? Like why, why are they even engaging in this behavior? There is always a reason. Behavior is communication. Then you have to think about what is the lesson that I want to teach here? It's not just to put them in a timeout because they hit, but like my role here in discipline is to teach. So why are they behaving this way? And what is the lesson that I want to teach in this moment? And the third question that I want you to ask yourself is, what is the best way I can teach the lesson? Is the child ready to learn it right now? Am I ready to teach it right now? Let me share a screen. If you wanted to take a screenshot of these three questions so that you remember them for yourself and that you think about these, mold them over as you, as you kind of go through it, you can take a screenshot of this. But here are the three questions. Why are they acting this way? What is behind this behavior? What is the lesson that I want to teach here? And what is the best way to teach it? The most, what, probably the most important one here is like, am I, am I even ready to teach right now? Sometimes we're not. Sometimes the reason we get into those more punitive strategies is because we are not ready. How many times have we not yelled or gave out a ridiculous ultimatum? Okay, well, we won't, 